You are listening to Did You Hear? 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 The Johnson County Library Podcast. This is your Library Insider. In this episode of Did You Hear? We're talking with Kate McNair about our teen zine, Elementia, and we'll also hear from some of our teen editors and authors. You'll also hear some of our librarians' favorite author quotes, as well as recommendations for e-books and e-audiobooks. But first, our weekly word. Impetrate. Beseech or beg for. Welcome to another edition of Did You Hear? This week's topic, Elementia. And to give us some insight about this incredible literary magazine is Kate McNair. Kate, what's your position at the library? I'm the Teen Services Coordinating Librarian. What are some of the responsibilities you have as a teen librarian at the library? Well, I help plan and coordinate events and services for teens in middle school and high school. I do a lot of work with our middle schools and high schools, going out and doing presentations, bringing authors and artists in for workshops and presentations. Um, And then, of course, I think one of the most fun parts of my job is working on Elementia, our teen literary magazine. Yeah, that's right. And just about this time of year, that's when that publication drops, right? Yes, we publish every April as part of National Poetry Month, and of course this year is a little bit different. Yeah, because in the past, it's been one of the most impressive physical publications that one could look at, and I think it's gotten some national recognition, has it not? Yeah, we have been, uh, we've won national awards. And uh, about a year ago, we were featured in the New York Times as a place where teens can publish their artwork and art and writing. So that was really amazing. I've never, you know, seen our publications name on the New York Times masthead. So that was exciting. Um, And yeah, we do, we publish every year and uh, we host a big party at our central resource library when we release the magazine and we give out free copies. Um, and it's this big moment of celebration and the first distribution yeah. of the magazine. And we get to see people kind of open it up for the first time and yeah. um, experience it. And it's a really special event in time. That's that's right. But this year, no in-person event, no physical copies, at least right now. And uh, you don't get to see those performances of uh, some of the contributors. No, that is um, a really sad part about this uh, particular time in America, and we were really sad to have to cancel our reception, um, but we're working to reschedule it, so I'm hoping we can still have those magical moments together, um, and we'll have news about that soon. But in the meantime, our editorial board decided um, that more than ever, we needed to find ways to connect with each other and share artwork and writing that is meaningful to us, um, and that um, both reflect and opens up other people's experiences to us. And so we've decided to release the digital edition of Elementia actually uh, about three and a half weeks earlier than we expected to. Oh, that's fantastic. So this is a... a, a digital version that can be accessed on online, I take it. Yes, it's free and it's live right now on the library's Elementia page, which is just jocolibrary.org slash Elementia. So peruse that right now. But that's not what this episode is about. This episode is to give you a taste of what went into the making of that publication and to hear some of, uh, from some of those authors themselves, right? Yeah, you're right, Dave. Uh, Elementia is really unique in that it is a magazine by teens and for teens. Uh, So it's all teen writing and artwork that you'll see in the magazine. But what you may not be able to tell just from flipping through its pages is that all of that uh, writing and artwork is selected by our teen editorial board and all of the pages are designed by our design board. Uh, So everything in there is the product of um, teen effort and talent and passion. Right. And so you uh, interviewed three of those uh, uh, producers of Elementor, correct? Yes, I did. I had the pleasure of working with them since last fall um, as the manager of the editorial team and the managing editor of Elementia. Um, And so it was really great to sit down with them after the culmination of six or more months of work and hundreds of hours of effort put into this magazine um, to talk about what Elementia means to them and why they're excited about this issue's release. 
And then you put out the request to all of the contributors to call my personal work phone number <laughs> and uh, do a live reading, leave it as a message on my phone, and I have those as digital files that we can have as part of this episode. Yeah, we're super excited about that. Normally, the release of the episode or the release of the magazine would be um, culminate in these readings of pieces that were published in the magazine. And for those that have attended an elementary reception, they can tell you how powerful that moment is when you sit in the audience and you hear an author performing their work. And so I think that was something that we were really sad about missing um, when we weren't able to host our reception at the end of April. And so I'm really excited that we have this venue. And thank you so much for opening up your voicemail um, to all of these voicemail messages. I am sure that was yes. probably the most fun to go in to your voicemail and hear poetry instead of please call me back at this number <laughs> well for sure and i cannot wait to share all of these authors with our audience as well as the interviews that you've had with uh the producers of elementra the magazine and without further ado let's get to it my name is ada heller and this is little red Let's make one thing clear. There wasn't a big bad wolf, not in my story. There was no screaming and running of little girls. This is an old story, one where the structure of power that had devoured the generations of women that came before lay in my bed, asking me to let it take one more. This is a story of a little girl who finally told him no, and the whole world turned red. Oh my, what big teeth you have. Hi, my name is Callan Latham, and this is my poem, African Violets. I will count them all, shards of glass in the mirror. Every part of me adds up to nothing. I'm standing in front of violets, in front of a Renaissance painting, and wondering what do I have tethering me to this earth other than a few pots of flowers. And I want to say you, but I could count the plastic rivers in a road and know that I'm already dying. And what's more is that I probably won't see you again. But now my stomach hurts and I've been eating too much and it reminds me of when I couldn't sleep. But now I want to sleep and that's all I want to do. Hi, my name is Katu Rowan, and this is my piece, Mother and Earth. Bent backs, grasses bent in a tweak of fingers, bent my fingers, bent my bones, my toes in earth, sweating dew, digging a way out. Sweetness, sucking on a single clover. Sweat for me. My back wet and bent, bones buried, snap like twigs, my bones tomorrow buried, my bones decay and feed, clovers, children. The wheel rolls on through this earth, my skeleton straight as a blade of grass, snapped by fingers like children at play. The world will go down and feed on me, and I will not see it. But only my fingers, a snapped clover, and its sweet ends. Thank you for listening to me. Hi, this is Amanda Penley calling in for the Elementra um, podcast. The title of my piece is Amateur Magician. Somehow, I pull the words out of my mouth like the colorful scarves inside the sleeve of an amateur magician. And we are both trying so hard to save our best magic trick to use on ourselves so that everyone can stop asking so much of us. Such constant noise and one day we will all show them how you can spend the day prophesizing yourself into the sky so that there finally is a wash of shh over the crowd as the clouds clear for constellations to take center stage. And now they are the ones spilling and overflowing with all of their stagnant connections. There is so much to be gained just by looking at them, and the same by looking at us, trying our best, reminding ourselves that even if we don't have all the answers, we will always have an abundance of possible solutions. We are the people that connect dots and give meaning to nothing, and it's time that I start piecing together the stars that once belonged in my brain. Look up at the aurora borealis. I was never fooling anyone. These colors are exactly what they appear to be. Thank you. Hi, I'm Callan Latham, and this is my poem, Five Fingers to Count a Hand. 
I wake before you and in the darkness, I don't recognize you right away. Your lashes bring their own light, full like fields of crows, a murder of crows. The birds nested on the hill I'm sure I've told you about in front of the tomb, white stones holding each other like people huddled in a storm. It reminds me of us again, where I'm holding your hand in the airport and theorizing about the birth of the floor tiles. You're going along with it, saying the dark spots in the stone cement are are the parts of space that flaked away when the earth became what it is, because space is dark, you say. I laugh, but I can't stop thinking about our darkness, the room filling with each of us. You know exactly how to hold me to you, curling me up like smoke from a fire. We are divided when we learn to fly, but I have broken my wings for you. I weave my fingers into yours, and you whisper about how we've learned about space, the fabric of stars clustering around us in empty homes. There are white stones in the airport tile, too. I'd like to think they mimicked the bed sheets, soft and glowing like us, and ready for sleep. Hi, this is Emmy McKenzie, and this is my poem, Where I'm From. I'm from the expressions of my people. Flattened nose and slits for eyes, leathery skin and cricks in my back, each feature of mine, a reflection of my family heritage. I'm from the calloused feet of my grandparents. Step after step, they walked towards a better future, flew on their first airplane to the USA, and called California the gates of heaven. A miracle that they made it off of a life-saving. I am from the broken Tagalog conversations over the phone. The signal offers us more connection than the similar blood running through both of our veins. Roasted plantains on the dinner table, foreign spices and sun damage over work hands. I am from half and half milk, split down the middle between two distinct colors, countries. I am from the moment of hesitation before bubbling in Asian under what race I am for the ACT. I am from the salt of the southern oceans, drying out the culture inside of me. I struggle to hold on to my past, the pieces of me halfway across the world, pieces of myself that I've never felt so far away from. This is Friends by Alexa Newsom. Tissues litter my floor, scraps of paper crumpled and overflowing my recycling bin, eraser bit. Cover my desk until the pale wood looks black. My friend cracks open the door, walks in. My head lifts off my desk, tired and stressed. My mouth opens to say, I can't do this. My hand gestures to the white paper-covered carpet. My friend grips me by the shoulder, calls me from my chair. My leg stand, support my weight while her mouth says, let's go take a walk in the forest. My eyes glance at the failures at my feet. Her arm pulls me out the room, down the stairs, out the door, into the fresh air, into the forest. We walk, hand in hand, listening to the rustling leaves and bird calls. Our shoes make little sound, the silence of the forest both empowering and calming. My tears dry. We don't talk, but we don't need to. She squeezes my hand once, twice. My shoulders relax, my posture improves. My head lifts high in a display of confidence. We set our eyes on the road to my home. I can do this. My friend knows I can and has reminded me that I can. Goosebumps and Gummy Bears by Jillian Knable. I'm from hard-worn leather beneath my feet, watching my second home from my favorite place four feet above the ground from sounds of gymnastics filling my ears to a layer of chalk and sweat that coats everything from my legs to the inside of my throat. It chokes me and tastes thick and starchy with every breath, but it doesn't matter. I am from the willow tree that hangs in the yard, stories that dance underneath until the last breath of summer has been taken from the goosebumps that engulf my arms as I dive in, into the books and into the pool. Swallowed by cool water and churning mines, I'm cold as winter takes my willow, but it doesn't really matter. I'm from shouts of here I come and pulling my best friend into a closet. Up, I mouth, and she nods. 
We climb to the top shelf and wedge ourselves into the small space until we sit facing each other, cross-legged, the cool surface of the wall pressing into our backs. I'm from her mysterious little bag she pulls from behind her back, and the small, sweet something she pops into her mouth, then one into my own. A certain sweet smell dances in my nose, and I bite down and realize what she's given me. A gummy bear. Grape. I giggle and my brother finds us, but it doesn't really matter. I'm from Grandma's sweet and rich chocolate cake. From the gentle clatter of dinner utensils and not-so-gentle conversations. My Zadie at one end of the table, my brother at the opposite, both loud and shouting. I'm from what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? I don't know and I don't care, bellowing laughs, slamming hands, and shaking tables. I have a headache, but who cares? I'm from the faded blue Lazy Boy kids' cartoons, 104 days of summer vacation, baby diapers, and worn changing tables. From time for stories to my mother's muffled, be right there. I'm so tired, but I'll go anyway. Realizing that sacrifice comes easy when it's something you love. This is Olivia J. Williams uh, reading her piece for Elementia uh, entitled Alleluia. I will never call a Latino papi, sino héroe, soldado, sobreviviente, brother in bondage, sibling in survival. The chains of the Hispanic clink with those of his black cellmate. We languish under the same white gall. Asian men rattle wire fences in 1930s internment camps. White supremacists live on black tiled land. One day, the bank of social justice will foreclose, me possess, me claim ownership. Till then, we languish. Like the pain filling up a four-year-old boy's gaze at the colorful toy store, Niggers not served here. Chinese go home. Jews have no place. Like the swastika carved into the plastic tabletop. In my school, filled with kids, who cheered when a white supremacist won the highest office in the nation. Like the time I learned, my melanin somehow brought down the property value. Three girls sit in a line on the curb, chins in hand. Their various brown-shaded skins sag under the weight of white beauty standards. We tried. We will build a land already watered by the blood of black brown bodies, by the tears of our great grandmothers and the screams of our sisters as our bodies swung from the trees and were lost forever in the river. We are bonded in struggle, woven together by oppression. It is a grim unity, and yet we rise in it. We are made bold by it. We fight in spite of progress because the knife driven into our backs has not even been pulled out six inches yet. We will move past the red, white, blue, dye our emblem red, yellow, green, black, brown, purple, a heritage to be proud of, one unified in struggle. This is Annie Berry reading She Took My Poems. Why do I allow myself to participate in something as dangerously stupid as love? Allow myself to participate, I say, as if I don't put myself up to bat in a room full of automatic pitch machines. Love looks at me like the cracks in the sidewalk look at your mother. Love stares at me like a little boy about to break his arm on a trampoline, like he's so excited to jump, to feel high, to feel something other than Earth's gravity, only for Earth to pull him back down and remind him that trying to feel something different can be fucking painful. Love sounds to me like a voice crack in a crying man, like out-of-tune electric guitars, like car alarms that won't turn off, like Fran Drescher's voice, and it smells like burning toast on a mom and dad want a divorce type of morning. Love screams at me through four windows rolled down in January, two hands gripping more than just a heavy wheel, and I scream back at her with a mix between the Oxford and Urban Dictionaries just to let her know that I still exist. Love is in the cashier's voice. It kind of sounded like yours. It probably didn't really sound like yours, but I heard it anyways. She is in every rearview mirror's back seat, and every side eyes almost saw something that was never really there. She sees what I never did in you, or maybe doesn't see what I really saw in you. Love comes back to you, even after you make out with her best friend. 
she finds you, even when you curse her out and tell her never to come back. Love just spent her last dollars on wine to help her write about you and whiskey to help her forget about you. She wakes up every morning with the taste of you still bitter on her tongue and the feeling of you still fresh in her stomach. To her, you look like the toilet bowl last night. And you look like her notebook's last page. And you look like her wet, freshly reddened cheeks and dripping nose. And you look like her favorite poem she's ever written. And you look like her most hated poem she's ever written. And you look like the worn letters on her backspace key. And you look like her. And you look like her. Love is more in love with you than I am with her. And I have been chasing her since she took my money and my poems and my sobriety and ran. And I have been out of breath since she gave them all to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Fessenden, and I am reading the piece Blink. I like to stare at the IKEA light fixture in the living room, letting the middle bulb sink into my shallow eyes. I look until it starts to hurt, my ripped fingernails gripping the worn suede of the couch as pupils get lost in the dangerous yellow. For a moment, I think of the solar eclipse when I looked at the sunlight with no barriers, staring death in the face with a veil of night drawn over it, laying on an inner tube in the middle of the lake with hands of Tootsie Pops and a friend. It was easy to like it. The raft we, the raft we lie on drifts to sitting on top of Oakhurst monkey bars, being upside down bats and not fighting with mom, then to the static of the slide as it lifts my eight-year-old hair away from everything, if I went back to the slide, it wouldn't lift my hair again. For some reason, I just know that. I finally look away from the light, uneven fingernails loosening their hold. Nothing is left in my gaze but spots of yellow and purple. I try to blink them away, but the spots grow and consume everything. My preschool picture in that pink and brighter dress that I would twirl in as my parents lift me above the hammock that is now consumed by ivy. The empty holes in the mantle where stockings hung precariously, her smelting the Ghirardelli, my cocoa burnt tongue lift off shiny foil, and my outstretched feet, almost as torn as my fingernail. All I see is the purple and yellow, even when I close my eyes. The hues creep into my lid until everything about me is exposed to the dizzying colors. I can't see anything else, but it can see everything. Maybe that's easier. Maybe it's easier, but I miss the static and joy of fairy houses and trees and stepping on raw pecans from the towering oak above my sunburnt head and solo cups of white flannel caterpillars that make little mouths scream for help when venom spreads to unsuspecting knuckles. Pricked fingers would turn as crimson as the overhanging mulberries by the curved concrete wall, whereas now a pricked finger is sterile and cold in the office void of salt and unfamiliar in my teeth as I fake a smile at whoever is behind the two-way mirror. I've forgotten what side of it I'm on. I've forgotten a lot of things. I used to look into the light and enjoy the geometric patterns that spread across my vision as soon as I looked away. Nothing was obscured by the colors, only enhanced and made into a masterpiece I could never recreate. Blinking made the patterns even better. Blinking also made them go away, eventually. Now, the patterns blind me and reach past my large pupils and cover up the wooden rings in my irises. Everything horrible that my eyes touch is still there even after I close them. I still blink anyways. Hi, my name is Neha Schrader, and I'm reading an excerpt from my essay, Coconut Kid. It is the cruelest form of irony that my coloring of black hair, tan skin, and dark brown eyes fits in so seamlessly with the rest of the crowd, yet I couldn't feel more out of place. Later in life, I will have a friend jokingly tell me I'm a coconut, brown on the outside, white on the inside, and this term for being whitewashed will be quickly brushed off as a joke, but it will be an aspect of me that is continually inescapable. Even now, as a child, I recognize this in some form. It is apparent in a way that I don't speak the languages that aunties and uncles prattle on in over our little heads, even though I can understand them and in the way that I feel no joy when I see the vibrant clothes and fragrant foods. This is my heritage. My parents were born and raised on the Indian subcontinent amid fresh produce vendors and cows freely roaming noisy streets. So, despite my very American roots and upbringing, I eat right on a daily basis and occasionally go to parties with the Indian community at the Hindu temple or at the homes of other Indian American families where I hardly know anyone. 
Every time I'm surrounded by this culture, I am reminded of how Indian culture is so flamboyant and unapologetic, as is often reflected in the amalgamation of spices found in Indian food and the colorful dyes used to make clothing, such as gagra. I, on the other hand, tend to be very reserved and quiet for the most part, and if one were to talk to my friends and family, they would tell you that I am overly cautious, which creates an automatic disconnect between my culture and me. It is not that I automatically dislike everything that there is about being Indian American, though if anyone had asked me that eight or so years ago, I would have had a much more negative outlook, but I don't automatically love everything about it either. There are things out of my control, such as unavoidable stereotypes about my level of intelligence or the ethnic ambiguity that comes with the occasional restaurant server speaking to me in Spanish, another language I don't understand because I vaguely look like I could be Latina. On the other hand, there are things about my heritage that are entirely up to me. After a childhood of being told I had to go to Indian parties and wear Indian clothes and eat Indian food without my parents ever asking me if I enjoyed any of it, I grew to resent what it meant to be Indian American. How was I supposed to automatically adore the culture of a country I have visited maybe five times in my life? I stopped eating Indian food as often as I used to. I managed to find a way to avoid every party. I rebelled against partaking in any sort of religious celebration. I had even stopped wearing traditional clothing since I was 11. The Indian culture faded in me until I almost forgot about it completely. I used to think this was a good thing, but as I grew older and became exposed to differing cultures and opinions, I regret not trying to connect to my cult heritage, and heritage more. I wish I'd seen the positive side of having a rich cultural background instead of trying to assimilate to the point where I don't know how to find my way back to being Indian anymore. Thank you. Hi, I'm Haley Renee Bourne, and this is a reading of my piece, The Heaven We've Been Slouching Towards Is Not The Heaven. The heaven we've been slouching towards is not the heaven. I feel that if I move from this spot, I will die. But I take a step forward and don't. God loves all his children. Silent night, moonlight slants through stained glass windows. Here in this cathedral, something is rotting. Behind my back, I press my right thumb into my left wrist, feeling the veins there. Dark things with sloping shoulders sift through pews like silt in water the stream of them murmuring. Voices too faded to hear, but speaking in unison gives them strength. I won't cover my ears, won't give them the satisfaction. Another few steps into the sun-bleached, moon-beamed church, I am surrounded. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I know where I have to go, and it isn't the altar. I won't kneel here, or I might never get up. They look at me with eyes too many and try to sell me things. Tell me who to be or how to marry. They're just looking out for me. Will I put my soul in their saving hands? Maybe just my retirement fund. Where are their hands? I pick up my pace, covering my face from prying. Inside the confessional, I feel absurdly, like I am almost safe. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I think God is a scratched record, I say, not willing to wait for an invitation. I've never seen a scratched record, let alone heard one playing. But now that I mention it, music seems to slide from behind the dividing screen, a distant hymn. It's just a metaphor now, no real purpose other than to conjure the image of sound repeating itself. Is a metaphor still a metaphor if the comparison is between something and a symbol for that same thing? I don't think so. I don't know. Scratching my forearm absently, listening for the sounds of feet approaching, I wait. Do I even want a response from that massive presence? I can feel it like a hundred insect legs under my skin. That's where the problem is. Inside, in the dark of our organs functioning. Our subconscious. Amen. We've said God so many times since that first time. I wonder what it meant then. Picturing the potential of that moment, the simplicity, it used to unwind me, but I've overused it. God is a promise so vague that anyone can use it to get what they want. But scratched records exist outside of a convenient metaphorical purpose. I've said too much and it will never be enough. Because I'm speaking into the ear of the great and terrible believer. I think that maybe I no longer have hands. I think that however many eyes I had, I now have more. I am among my peers in a place possessed. I can only walk here because I have been baptized in the same poison that makes this place bearable. 
I stand up, shoulders slouching, and leave the confessional. The church is full of people chatting. I check the time, decide I don't like the late night service. Accidentally making eye contact with someone from work, I should know her name but don't. I nod and smile and move purposefully toward the open doors. Hope I look stable, unremarkable, keeping my arms pressed to my sides in case there are unsavory stains. I let my feet trace a path on the street like touching familiar scars. I walk home feeling guilty, always feeling guilty. Our librarians called in to tell you about e-library excitement. Hi, this is Brian Ortel, Johnson County Library Makerspace Facilitator. Uh, I'm calling to recommend Hunt for the Wilder People. It's a movie by uh, New Zealand filmmaker uh, Taiko Waititi. He's directed uh, Thor Ragnarok, uh, What We Do in the Shadows. So it's a super charming, funny, coming-of-age story about a foster kid and his uh, adopted family. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about Canopy, um, but Canopy... With your library card, you get access to 10 films a month, and you have like three days to watch the film. I'm watching it on my Roku, on my living room TV, but you can also watch it through um, Apple products, um, Google products as well. Um, there's a lot of different films on there from like Criterion Collection films, a lot of classic films like The Conversation, uh, Rashomon, um, Lots of great movies. The Squid and the Whale is also on there. Um, so it's a great service that you have access to uh, with your library card. Hi, Dave. It's Cheryl, and I'm a clerk at the Gardner and Edgerton and Spring Hill branches. And I wanted to tell you about a service for our patrons that I think is really great and I've been utilizing for a few years now. Under our e-library banner, if you click on that and then you go to e-learning, you can scroll down and you come to the tab that says Universal Class. And if you go to that, you can sign in with your library card. You can create an account. And if you already have an account, you can go and you can take a lot of different classes. I personally have loved the journal and memoir writing. They've got tons of other writing classes that you can also take, but especially during this time when we're all confined. And I think that you know, we're connecting with family. It's really been great to revisit this class, even though I've already taken it. Go back through some of the exercises and even ask some family members some questions about, especially my siblings, what did you remember um, about our childhood and growing up and the different experiences and um, capturing those. So anyway, I just wanted to tell everybody about universal classes. They are wonderful and they're free and you can take new ones and you can even retake ones that you've already done and redo the assignments and um, experience it all over again. So anyway, I hope everybody's staying safe and um, have a great day. Bye. Hi, this is Emily from Monticello Library. I'd like to introduce you to the love of my life, Basilton Grimm Pitch. He's the arch nemesis of Simon's No, the worst chosen one to ever be chosen. This Harry Potter-esque teen fantasy is my favorite. It's available both on um, on Access 360 and ebook and e-audio. You can find it by Rainbow Brow. Carry on. Hi, this is Jana from the Gardner, Edgerton, and Spring Hill branches. I wanted to tell you about an easy source called Culturegrams. You can find it under the Research tab in the Homework Help for either kids or teens. Um, it's a great resource for doing homework. Um, you can, there's a world edition, a kids edition, and you can do states or Canadian provinces. And so you can look up geography stuff. Um, you can find photos. You can do data tables, find out about the different government leadership, statistics, all kinds of stuff like that. But the way I like to use it, especially now that we are stuck at home, is they have a recipe selection. So if you're in the States edition, you could look up Texas and do some Texas red chili, or you could look up Massachusetts and do some New England clam chowder. Um, if you are in the world edition, maybe you want to look up Egypt and do, try to make some falafel, 
or you could look up Romania and do some cabbage pancakes. There's just lots of different things to um, learn about and new things to try while you have some time at home. So I hope you check it out. Thanks. Bye. Hi, this is Jana from the Gardner, Edgerton, and Spring Hill branches. I wanted to tell you about an easy source called Culturegrams. You can find it under the Research tab in the homework help for either kids or teens. Um, it's a great resource for doing homework. Um, you can, there's a world edition, a kids edition, and you can do states or Canadian provinces. And so you can look up geography stuff. Um, you can find photos. You can do data tables, find out about the different government leadership, statistics, all kinds of stuff like that. But the way I like to use it, especially now that we are stuck at home, is they have a recipe selection. So if you're in the States edition, you could look up Texas and do some Texas red chili, or you could look up Massachusetts and do some New England clam chowder. Um, if you are in the world edition, maybe you want to look up Egypt and do, try to make some falafel, or you could look up Romania and do some cabbage pancakes. There's just lots of different things to um, learn about and new things to try while you have some time at home. So I hope you check it out. Thanks. Bye. So to start, what is your name, school, and grade? Uh, my name is Renee Bourne. I'm a senior at Olathe North High School. And what is your history with Elementia? When were you first published? Uh, when did you join the editorial team? What work did you do on this issue? Yeah, uh, I was first published in the 15th issue of Elementia. Um, and then I was lucky enough to be um, published again in the best of issue and in the 16th issue. Um, and then this year is my first time working behind the scenes. And I sort of decided to go all or nothing. So I joined both the editorial board and the design committee. And we loved having you on both of them. Uh, and yes. your work is also in this issue. You have two yes. pieces of writing, right? Yes, I do. Uh, so this issue is all about connection and it's been released. We decided to release it early um, in a time when we're self-isolating and staying at home and social distancing ourselves from others. Uh, what do you think, like, why is it important to release a magazine like this or about connection at this time? And do you think that um, when, like, this period that we're living through is going to change how people see or read the magazine? I think um, it's really important now more than ever to remember just the broad application of connection, that it's not just physical or in-person kind of a thing, as we've all been realizing over the past couple of weeks, as that has no longer been an option. Um, but I think that people reading the issue, it might help them broaden their definition of connection, um, which is always changing and adapting anyway, but especially now. For sure. We're definitely um, experiencing new ways to connect. <laughs> Are you uh, trying any new ways to connect with other people during this time? Well, I've never been much of a FaceTimer myself, but I am FaceTiming friends to talk every once in a while. Um, we, <laughs> I drove to a parking lot and sat in my car next to a friend <laughs> the other day, uh, sitting in their respective car. Um, so that was interesting. So getting really creative with your connections now. Indeed. Uh, is there a piece of writing or art uh, from this issue that you would recommend um, that readers of the magazine um, really pay attention to? Um, well, I don't know how topical it is. It's not really 100% um, related to the situation we're in now, but... There's a just a, a poem called The Trees and Us, which is just a little lovely sort of bittersweet poem that kind of makes me want to cry every time I read it. So if you if you're looking for that kind of a thing, a little bit of a, an emotional release, um, definitely go for it. I really like that poem. I think it's I think it's really good. 
And I think that one, I was um, rereading that one after you recommended it. And uh, it has, especially now that so many of us um, were are going outside and going for walks and kind of rediscovering That's our true. neighborhoods and our city, like it does have this... Um, this really prescient meaning to it where you really are considering stuff. And and also like I was reading an article that air pollution went way down in China when they stopped factories. And um, so right. I do think like this is a unique time where we're kind of all reconnecting with nature. Um, and at the same time, we're kind of giving nature a break by stopping driving so much and factory work and all of that. So I think it is actually kind of timely. I didn't you think said about that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there perfect. A, yeah. it. <laughs> are there uh, any other thoughts or memories about Elementia or issue 17 that you want to share? Um, I just think, I think, well, like speaking from the perspective of someone who is a teenager, I'm 18 and this was, this is, I guess, my last year of high school. <laughs> um, and I know that it's just so strange to like, go home for spring break and then essentially be told never to come back. Uh, and I know that other people, especially um, teenagers or people who are in transitional periods in their lives, are feeling the same sort of unease or uncertainty. And I think that it, it can just be really nice to read work and look at art and remember that there are lots of other people out there, you know, even if you can't see them on a daily basis anymore, uh, they're all sort of going through it. They're doing their own, they're doing their own thing. But even if we're not physically together, we're all sort of getting through this together. Yeah, we have this odd moment of a shared experience that we're all experiencing separate from each other. <laughs> right, separately but, but sharing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a very unique time, and it's a, like we said, a very unique. Uh, perspective on connection that we're all getting. So I feel like the magazine is particularly topical. Um, but about the magazine also, it has amazed me this year being on um, the design and editorial boards, how much time and effort goes into this publication. Not that I thought it was easy, just, you know, seeing it for yourself. Um, and the writing is incredible. And I always get lost in it when I'm reading the magazine. But I was also amazed by how much care the designers put into their spreads and how every detail was considered. So advice to somebody reading the magazine online or hopefully in paper when that becomes an option, um, definitely take a moment to just look at it, you know, just appreciate all of the uh, little details that I think really enrich the experience. Yeah, I'm always impressed with how much care everybody takes the discussions that we have on the editorial board and the yeah. um just the yeah the genuine care the the um like the protectiveness and the responsibility that the editors feel that they bring to mm -hmm. every discussion and the designers are constantly racking their brains with super creative ways to put the artworks like best foot forward on the page and kind of blend writing and art. Like that's a really right. unique job too. We just, we all seem to take it really personally, essentially everyone on the, on the behind the scenes team really personally cares about, this publication. And I think that it shows and that it's very impressive. It is. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Of course, it's been a blast. All right. So can we start with uh, what is your name and where do you go to school and what is your year in school? Sure. I'm Yossi Farahmania and I'm a freshman at KU. And what is your history with Elementia? Like, when were you first published? When did you join the editorial and design team? And what was your role on issue 17? So I joined Elementia in 2017, and I took on both, like, editorial and the design committee, which was which just seemed really fun. And I didn't have anything to do that summer, so I was like, this is cool, I'll do this. And I actually think uh, this issue that just came out, issue 17, will be my first time um, being published in Elementia, but I've been with like Elementia for like three years now. And my role in the past one was also, I was also in the design and editorial committee, which was really fun. Uh, yeah. 
You were totally in the last issue. Was Come on, I? Yes. I yeah, remember. remember you read at the reception. I can't remember the name of the piece. I want to say it was, was something it about there? chaos. Yeah. It was your really angry piece where you like yell at the world. It was also in the Blue Valley North Lit Mag. Yeah, it was something about walls. <laughs> I don't remember the title though. <laughs> wow. Well, you were totally in there and you read at the reception and it was awesome and yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So we can all go and relive it. <laughs> Um, so this issue is all about connection and it's being, we've released it early and we're really excited about that, but it's coming out in a time where we're isolating, we're staying at home, we're distancing ourselves from others. Um, so why do you think it's important to release Elementra right now in this time? And do you think that the context that it's being, that it's going out into the world in will change how people see and read the magazine? I totally do. I think it's such a weird but great coincidence at the same time that our theme for this um, issue was connection and it's coming out at a time like this and I just like things that are happening in the world right now that seem like they could have happened even if we weren't in quarantine or even if we weren't social distancing so they seem like life is just going on with no hitch um it's it is important to be mindful of what's going on, but I think there are some things that kind of normalize what's going on right now, which I really appreciate. And I think the early release, even if it's digital, um, it's just so good <laughs> from like my uh, point of view. Which I mean, I worked on the magazine, and so many other people did, and it's just good to see our work out there. But it also it's also fantastic to see like um, to know to have that knowledge that. Oh, people around us or from like other states too are we're thinking about like connection in like a certain point of view and they're molding connection in their own hands and like it's coming out now and people reading it will um I think like just hearing young voices even though it's not really hearing reading young voices is so inspiring I mean I'm a little bit older from when I joined now and reading um like the works of like my friends that are younger than me now I really understand how like this process of writing and growing while you're writing works uh, I just think it's important to get their voices out there young voices out there even though um, you know we've been doing that for a couple of years now but I think at this time especially you just need to hear that people are you know as uh, sympathetic and empathetic as possible around you so it kind of gives me this like warm hug that I I know that these people around me are writing about this and I know that um they're we're all in this together basically to sound cliche but you know that's how I feel yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point that um, right now it might be even more important than ever to listen to young voices because we are all going through this experience, but we're all experiencing it differently. And exactly. the, the news media and the other the other stories that are pushed at us are often stories of adults or, um, you know, the COVID-19 virus is particularly impacting older Americans and so and older people. And so we're hearing lots of stories about that, um, but also listening to these stories and experiences of younger people, um, because it's so it's so very different how it impacts um, young people. Oh, totally agreed. Yes. Um, is there a piece of writing or a piece of art from this issue that you would want to recommend that people um, explore or discover for themselves? Oh, I have so many. <laughs> I love Ada H Heller's work um, in like all all she published, all she that she like uh, submitted and was published in the issue. But I specifically like this issue called um, Remember Summer, and it's anonymous which again, makes it more interesting and mysterious, but I, I'd recommend people reading that. It's um, It just seemed really passionate to me when I was reading it. Uh, and artwork, I just love Step in the Snow by Bill Chang. It's, it's, so, it's so good. <laughs> I just love how um, it looks like, I don't know, it looks like it could be in a museum right now and it could be like a 3D work of art, but it's I just love how he used paint in that. So yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Are th is there anything else about Elementia that you want to share or anything else that you want readers to know? 
Um, I want to urge them to submit to our next issue because the theme is bodies and that's like one of my favorite themes that we've ever done. And uh, that's what I'm really looking forward to. I'm as I'm sitting at home quarantine, I'm just trying to think of um, prompts or like, I don't know, topics to write about, but manipulate them in a way that would relate to our next theme, which is bodies. I'm just really excited about the next theme. That's yeah. <laughs> I am too. I think mm-hmm. it's going to be an amazing issue. And I think, um, you know, for me, at least this is a time where I'm at home and I am so much more aware of everything around me and inside of me. And I'm grateful for the body Mm -hmm. that I have and, and the health that it has and kind of figuring out what it can do in a limited space as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. Well, I'm, thank you very much, uh, for talking with me today. Uh, and, We look forward to seeing the next issue of Elementia. Absolutely. Me too. Thank you. Okay. So the first thing that I want to ask you is, what is your name and what school do you go to in your grade? Okay. So I'm Peter Mombello. I go to Blue Valley North High School and I am currently a sophomore. And what is your history with Elementia? When were you first published and when did you join the editorial team? And what was your role this year for issue 17? Yeah, so um, I was published in Elementia two years ago while I was in eighth grade. And then I was asked and interested in becoming an editor for next year, for uh, last year's Elementia. And I joined then. Um, And then I've been with it for the second year, which is great. And I love it so much. Um, Yeah, so I'm pretty much helping pick out pieces that we feel represent our theme well and people could identify with, and that's pretty much my job. (laughs) About how much time would you say that you spent working on this issue, do you think? Um, Probably about 50 hours, because it is a lot of reading, and we do have the occasional meeting, too. All right. Well, this issue is all about connection. At the time that we selected that theme and you were on the, in the group that selected uh, the theme of connection, we did not realize that it would be coming out in a time uh, when we were self-isolating and staying at home and distancing ourselves from others. How do you think that will impact how the issue is received or interpreted or read? I think as of right now, it's going to be accepted so well because Some of the pieces are about not having connection and just being kind of alone, which is kind of everyone's situation right now. And I think it is a little uplifting too, because you do have those great pieces that are like all about like love and human connection, like Spaghetti Boyfriend. And I feel that that is just such a positive message that we all need right now, because we are all in this together and it's not going to stop until we stop going out. (laughs) Yeah, so why do you think it's important to put out an issue of Elementia right now? We've decided to release the digital edition early. Um, Why do you think it's important to put out this um, magazine of teen writing and art now amidst this pandemic? So being self-isolated isn't the best on people's mental health. And I think that is especially a big thing among like my generation being in high school, kind of stressed out about not what's about not knowing what's going on. And then especially you have the added layer of like, when is this going to end? So I feel like sending this out right now is sending like the positive message that we all just need a little bit of. And it's like, even if this does last like another season, another year or whatever, that we are still like, we're still all together and we know what to do. Yeah, there are some universal experiences across each other, right? Yeah, very much so. Well, in that vein, then, is there a piece of writing or a piece of art that you would want people to really look deeply at right now? Mm -hmm. So my favorite piece in this magazine is Fancy a Game of Darts by Olivia Humphrey. And it is about this, like, is it about a dysfunctional family? And when I was putting, when I was, like, deciding if I wanted to have it in the magazine or not, I was like, okay, I really like the writing. But now that I'm like (laughs) stuck with my family in my house for that long, it's like just nice knowing that someone also feels a bit of the same stuff. 
And then my favorite piece of art is, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Sonar by Audrey Diggs. And it is this like post-impressionistic portrait. And I love it so much because it's, it doesn't have, a, the person is unidentified and we don't know who it is but it could be anyone and it kind of looks like my friend. So I just love thinking that this could be anyone. Yeah. I love every time I turn um, or I guess scroll to the page that has that piece of artwork on it. There's something so striking. It's a zoomed up photo or a painting of a face. And there's something so striking about the angle that the perspective is at and the eyes are kind of half lidded and it's just, it immediately draws you in. I totally know exactly what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there anything else about Elementia that you want to share about your experience or about this issue? Yeah. So we put the editors and the designers put a lot of effort and work and we do like one of my favorite pieces didn't get in the magazine, but that's okay. But um, if you didn't get in this year, please, please submit next year. Please. I cannot stress that enough because some sometimes the theme is just a little bit off for the piece, but we think it would work super well next year. So yes, please submit again. <laughs> Those are good, encouraging words to end on. So I want to thank you for the interview today. um, And we look forward to people submitting to the next issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our youth services librarians left messages with their favorite author quotes from easy readers to kids books to young adults. Have a listen. Hey, Dave, this is Becky Carlton. As you know, I am a youth information specialist at the Oak Park Library, and I wanted to share a quote for your podcast. Um, It is by Anne Lamott, L-A-M-O-T-T, and it is from her amazing book, Bird by Bird, Some Instructions on Writing and Life, which is available Um, as an e-book through our e-library. And the quote is this, you own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. Thanks. Beth Markowitz, Youth Services at Central. The title of the book is The Girls Who Went Away. Author is Anne Tesler. It's a nonfiction book. And the quote I like is, what can people do? What can any of us do to help another human being? How do you find the right words or amount of support? I don't know. That's very, very difficult. Sometimes just listening, just letting a person talk it out and work through it is probably the best. Not being judgmental or having all the answers just accepting. Oh, hi, this is Vasu Chakravarti. I am a clerk at Blue Valley Branch. My quote is from Emmanuel's Dream by Laurie and Thompson. Um, it says, My, uh, in this world, we are not perfect. We can only do our best. Hello, this is Ruth Reddenbaugh. I'm a page at Cedar Row. My quote is from Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. For more episodes of Did You Hear, go to the Johnson County Library website, jocolibrary.org slash didyouhear. Please, stay safe, everyone.